Well, good morning. My name is Keith Harris, and I'm the preaching minister for the Winsong Congregation in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm deeply honored and delighted to have this opportunity to participate in this workshop, and I'm grateful to everyone at Home Mission for your continued dedication to proclaiming the good news of Jesus and, and working so tirelessly to strengthen and encourage congregations throughout our country. You know, I read a story of a monk who entered a monastery, and this monk took a 10-year vow of silence. And being the strict adherent that he was, he didn't speak a word for 10 years. At the end of those 10 years, his fellow monks waited eagerly to hear what he would say. He only spoke two words. He said, food, bad. The monk then entered into another 10-year vow of silence, and after 10 more years, he spoke two more words. He said, bed hard. Yet again, the monk took a 10-year vow of silence, and at the end of another 10 years, the monk simply stated, I quit. At this, the abbot of the monastery said to the monk, well, it doesn't surprise me one bit. You've done nothing but complain since you got here. You know, it's easy for us to reach a point of complaining, isn't it? Because life is filled with dark caves that leave us feeling confused, disappointed, fearful, and lonely. British philosopher and atheist Bertrand Russell once told of an experience he had in life. He said, There was a footpath leading across fields to New Southgate, and I used to go there alone, to watch the sunset and contemplate suicide. I did not, however, commit suicide because I wished to know more of mathematics. Later, he had this to say about life here on earth. He said, The life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain, towards a goal that few can hope to reach and where none can tarry long. One by one as they march, our comrades vanish from our sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Brief and powerless is man's life. On his and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls, pitiless and dark. Blind to good and evil, reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. For man condemned today to lose his dearest, tomorrow himself to pass through the gates of darkness, it remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow falls, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day. Now that's fairly depressing, isn't it? But the truth is there are people all around us, just like Bertrand Russell, who see their present and their future as being harsh, dark, frustrating, hopeless, and lonely. In an article which appeared in Psychology Today in August of 1980, Philip Zimbardo wrote, I know of no more potent killer than isolation. There is no more destructive influence on physical and mental health than the isolation of you from me and of us from them. Now, certainly the feelings of loneliness and isolation can take its toll on our emotional well-being and, and often bring challenges that seem to transform our sense of security and belonging into depression and despair. Many throughout the history of humanity have experienced this feeling of loneliness in a variety of circumstances in life. American theologian and author A.W. Tozer noted, most of the world's great souls have been lonely. And we know this to be true even in biblical times. Even a, a cursory reading of the Bible reveals a number of individuals who understood the loneliness that can accompany a heart intent on following the will of God. You know, David was young and still small in stature when he made the journey to the front lines of the battle. His brothers were there, serving as some of the fighting men under the command of Saul. As David arrived at the battle site, 
What he witnessed was the taunting of the people of God by a Philistine giant. Goliath was a towering figure against whom none of the Israelite soldiers dared to face. David heard Goliath utter the same taunts he had been breathing out against the Israelites for the past 40 days. Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, David, uh, in shock at the cowardice and the, the lack of trust in the power of God on the part of the Israelites, he said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So David took five smooth stones in his sling. And with no armor or sword, he made the walk down the hill to the valley below alone. This must have been quite a sight to behold. David, a youth armed with only a sling and stones. Goliath, a warrior from his youth, a towering figure who had a shield bearer going before him. To all those present, David didn't stand a chance. How can this boy, who's never been trained in warfare, defeat this champion alone? This story is perhaps one of the most familiar stories of the Old Testament. We remember how David took one of those five stones and placed it in his sling. He slung that one stone, released it, and hit Goliath squarely in the forehead. The Bible says the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Well, having witnessed David defeat their champion, the Philistines fled with the Israelites pursuing them from behind. And David's fame began to grow after he defeated the great Philistine giant. Saul even made him a high-ranking officer in the army. David enjoyed great success, but it wasn't long before Saul became very angry because the people were acknowledging David's greatness more so than his own. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 and 7 says, As they were coming home when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and with songs of joy and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. Well, this obviously made Saul very angry. So Saul began plotting to have David killed. In 1 Samuel 19, we see Saul telling his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. But Jonathan, who saw David as a brother, told David to hide. Jonathan attempted to 
reason with Saul and was seemingly successful. Saul listened to Jonathan and said, As surely as the Lord lives, David will not be put to death. But after another war broke out and David enjoyed yet another victory, Saul was enraged and he tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. But David escaped and he fled to Naoth at Ramah. Saul sent men to get David and eventually went himself. And it was at this time that David fled Naoth and returned to Jonathan. At the beginning of 1 Samuel 20, we see an exchange between David and Jonathan. David said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And Jonathan said to him, Far from it. You shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It's not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Think about those words. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. This must have been a terrible feeling for David. You know, much of his time had been and would be spent on the run. No doubt he felt alone. Do you know anyone that feels alone? Do you ever feel as though you are all alone, even within ministry? Do you ever feel uh, that as you seek to fulfill the task of spreading the good news, of, of following Jesus' great commission, that those around you are simply not interested? You know, we often feel this sense of loneliness as we face a world that is increasingly hostile toward Christianity. Many people face adversity and, and feelings of loneliness each day. And the struggle is real, and the inward pain is intense. And the truth is, life is filled with dark caves that leave us feeling confused, disappointed, fearful, and lonely. And just like David, many feel there's only a step between them and death. Many are held captive by fear and a lack of understanding. For David, the threat of death was a reality. Jonathan devised a plan for David to be sure of Saul's intent. And David hid in a field away from the king's palace for two days. And Jonathan would determine, based on Saul's demeanor, if David's life was in jeopardy. Well, Jonathan notified David of Saul's sure intent to kill him. So David fled to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. 1 Samuel 21 records the moment David arrived in Nob. And Ahimelech asked David a question that I'm sure David had asked himself before. Why are you alone and no one with you? Well, David explained to Ahimelech that he was on a secret mission and he asked Ahimelech for provisions and was given some bread. David, on the run, didn't have any form of protection, no weapon to use for self-defense. And the Bible says that David asked Ahimelech, Have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And Ahimelech said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, Behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There's none like it. Give it to me. You know, there are times in life when we feel as if we are all alone. And we may even feel this way as we think about the mission that God has set before us. We know there are people all around us, but at times we may feel a sense of loneliness as we seek to accomplish 
God's will. So what do we do when we feel that we're standing on an island all alone? Well, after taking the sword of Goliath from Ahimelech, David uh, made his way to Achish, the king of Gath. And uh, those that were with Achish realized who David was. And David was afraid for his life once again. And so uh, he acted like a madman, foaming at the mouth. And, and they turned him loose. And David ran away from Gath, trying to find safety. It was at this point that we see David running for his life and ending up in the cave of Adullam. It was from this cave that David wrote Psalm 142. You know, David found himself confused, disappointed, fearful, lonely, and unable to understand why this was happening to him. And, and he called out, with my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. You know, the acknowledgement of God's abiding presence is paramount in our journey of faith. And David wrote, When my soul faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, O Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. You know, in those moments of frustration and confusion, when we're wondering why others don't have the same level of concern for proclaiming the gospel as we do, when we feel alone, we must remember that God is our refuge. As we see David pouring his heart out to God in several psalms. We're also able to see the comfort and the peace and the rest that God provides to his people. In Psalm 40, David wrote, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. David was certainly familiar with loneliness and despair, but he knew full well the steadfast love and unending faithfulness of God. When we face challenging moments in our lives and in our ministry, we must always remember that God loves us more than we can possibly imagine. And though at times we feel alone, we know that we can cry out to God and he hears us. But God doesn't only hear us, he responds, giving us exactly what we need at just the right time as he did with David. Perhaps one of the greatest examples of one who experienced adversity and feelings of loneliness is the prophet Elijah. His struggle was real and the inward pain that he experienced was intense for Elijah, his circumstance in 1 Kings 19 was a very literal dark cave that left him feeling confused, disappointed, fearful, and lonely. Having defeated the 450 prophets of Baal, Elijah was on what we might refer to as a spiritual high. Confident and, and certain of God's working in his life, he must have felt as though nothing could break his spirit. But that feeling quickly changed. The Bible says Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets of Baal with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid and he arose and he ran for his life and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Now, it was under this broom tree that Elijah expressed his despair to God. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better 
than my father's. Well, following instructions from an angel and, and taking food and drink, which sustained him for the next 40 days, Elijah arrived at Horeb, the mountain of God. At Horeb, he found a cave and he lodged in it. And God said to Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. After this exchange, God told Elijah to go and stand on the mount before the Lord. And Elijah did so. The Bible says, And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his cloak around his face and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Well, Elijah again answered God's question. He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it. At this response, God reassured Elijah that he was not alone. You know, the enterprise of evangelism can be difficult and certainly requires a lot of effort. The emotions and, and feelings that accompany one of the most important responsibilities of the Christian can range widely. At times, we worry that we might say the wrong thing. We fear that someone may ask a question for which we have no sufficient answer. We see all of the social issues within our world today, and we're concerned with how we'll be able to overcome the barriers that exist in a world that seems to be pushing Christianity aside. On the other hand, we experience a sense of victory when a Bible study goes smoothly. We feel an overwhelming joy when a Bible study leads to a conversion. You know, but there's a, another aspect of discipleship that we often avoid bringing up. Loneliness can overtake us without giving any warning. It can often be like a snake, coiled up, camouflaged by the leaves and twigs on the ground, striking suddenly, its poison quickly coursing through the veins of our minds. It's the feeling of confusion, disappointment, and fear. We can often find ourselves feeling as though we're the only one concerned with fulfilling this important mission. We live among people who desperately need the good news, but we feel as if we're on an island alone with people all around us who seemingly refuse to hear the message of salvation. You know, we can shout it from the rooftops, yes, but if no one cares to acknowledge that we're shouting, then we're left with this challenging and overwhelming sense of loneliness. Sadly, many Christians have experienced this feeling and ended up speaking the same words Elijah spoke in despair. It is enough. And they give up on the mission, choosing to hide out in the cave of confusion, disappointment, fear, and loneliness. You know, part of the challenge we face as we seek to accomplish God's will is to remember that difficulties will come. Certainly, loneliness and the wide array of emotions that come along with it are difficult indeed. 
In his letters, the Apostle Peter reminded his readers of the hardships we'll face as followers of Jesus. And it would do us well to remember first his words toward the conclusion of his first letter. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You know, the challenges we face in life are not unique to us. The sense of loneliness that can overwhelm us is not unique to us. We're not alone, though we often convince ourselves that we are. In the same way, Elijah, who had convinced himself that he was alone and that he was the only one left, and, and he was reassured by God that he was not alone, so too we are not alone. And God assures us of that. So what do we do when we feel overwhelmed by loneliness in our mission to accomplish God's will? I think first, we need to remember who God is. When we lose sight of His power and majesty, our perspective on our circumstances is not what it should be. We need to remember who He is. And second, we need to cultivate our relationship with God. Seeking His face, acknowledging Him as our refuge and strength, pouring our heart out to Him in prayer will remind us that we're not alone. Thirdly, we need to allow God's Word to penetrate our heart. God's Word is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible is filled with words of reassurance and God's precious promises that will support and bolster our faith. And finally, we need to ask God to supply us with His strength to sustain us. God is the Alpha and Omega the beginning and end. He is the almighty God. And thanks be to God that His power is at work within us. Loneliness is a, a dark cave that's filled with confusion, disappointment, and fear. And if we find ourselves in that cave, we need to remember the question of God. What are you doing here? God calls us to action he calls us to proclaim the good news boldly and fearlessly. But God doesn't call us to this mission alone. Jesus promises, I am with you always to the end of the age. And when we feel that overwhelming pressure of loneliness, we must remember that God is always with us, that he is willing and able to supply his strength to sustain us, and that his faithfulness continues through all generations. And I'm convinced that when we remember this, we'll be able in any circumstance to say, though none go with me, I still will follow.